Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Passive Investing Show. I'm your host, Ava Benasaki, and I'm joined by my co-host, August Vinyaz. We have another incredible show for you today. Please like and subscribe as it helps us build our channel and allows us to keep bringing you great content and expert guest speakers. Now, our mission is to empower investors to earn passive income through real estate investing. We're excited as today we are joined by Dave Dubow. Dave Dubow is the creator of Money Partner Formula, and he works with mom and pop real estate investors and helps them to get started with raising capital. He's a best-selling author and speaker based in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Now, he began his real estate investing career in 2003, doing 18 deals in 18 months. And nowadays, he invests passively in multifamily properties. So we believe this interview will bring immense value to both experience and novice active investors attempting to scale their capital raising process. Welcome, Dave. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Thank you guys very much for having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Great. Uh, Dave, could you just start off, please, by telling us a little bit about your background and your start in real estate? Well, thanks. Yeah. So I'm born and raised in British Columbia, way up north in a little place called Fort St. John. And I kind of grew up around real estate investing without realizing it. Uh, my father and my grandfather built a sixplex. That was the family home <laughs> when I was growing up. My mother got into real estate investing and built up a portfolio of about 50 rental units in the 70s and the 80s. That was before there were resources like what you guys have here with your, your program and podcasts and all that kind of stuff. And where there still was kind of that glass ceiling going on. So um, been around it, but I didn't pay very much attention to it like most kids, right? You just It, it just seems to be normal. And then <laughs> went to school in your neck of the woods, went to university at, the, at UBC Graduated way, way, way back in 1990 with a useless degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. And surprise, surprise, nobody was bashing down my door saying, hey, Dave, here's a real high paying job with your uh, with your degree. So I decided to go travel around the world and see a bit of the world. So I did that. Traveled around Latin America for about two and a half years and settled down in a little country called Costa Rica. You guys familiar with Costa Rica? Yes. Yeah. So I actually lived there for 10 years. Uh, started a language training company from scratch, got married to a Costa Rican, had two little Costa Rican kids, had a good life. Uh, life was going well. And then in 2003, we said, screw it, let's let's move back to Canada. And everybody kind of gives me this look like, Dave, I mean, most Canadians would love to go retire in a tropical paradise like Costa Rica. There you, you left Costa Rica and you came back to BC, you settled down in Kamloops. Why? And here's the thing, if, if uh, you've never lived outside of Canada for a while, you don't realize how good we have it here in this country and how many opportunities there are. So Costa Rica is fantastic, highly recommend it. But I'm kind of a, if, in case you didn't notice, I'm kind of a pasty faced white guy. And whether you have money or not, people assume that you do. So there's a bit of a target on your back and that of your family as well. Not a big issue in Kamloops. So <laughs> so when we moved back, uh, my kids were getting towards school age and we decided to make a fresh go of it. And then that's that that's where the whole real estate journey started, because it's kind of like, OK, what am I going to do next? Like I hadn't been able to sell my business in Costa Rica, so we didn't have a lot of cash. I've been gone for so long. We didn't have bad credit. I had zero credit. I had been self-employed for so long. I was pretty much unemployable. So then it was where where do we go next? And that's where real estate came along. Great, great. Yeah, thanks for sharing that background with us. Um, now, you're a thought leader and an educator in the real estate private equity space. What was it in particular about raising capital that piqued your interest to dedicate a significant amount of time to this aspect? Good question, Ava. Here's what piqued my interest. I sucked at it. <laughs> that's what piqued my interest uh, a, a significant crash and burn in my professional life is what started it all so uh, I didn't actually start raising capital until about 2010 2011 give or take I, I did those you know way back in 2003 to 2005 did those 18 creative deals in, in 18 months took some time off uh, did did some marketing work for an up and coming real estate guru for a few years. That's where I started writing books and teaching and training and stuff. 
And then I jumped back in and, and got out of the, the creative, no money, low money down type space into actually buying properties. And like a lot of people, I don't know if you guys had a similar journey, journey I was able to self-finance my first couple of houses. You know, I, by that time I had some, I had some cash and I had some credit. So that was great. So like most people, I self-financed. And then, the, of course, the perfect deal fell in my lap, but I didn't have any more money. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard this expression, just find a good deal and the money will find you. Have you guys heard that one? Yes. yes. Well, so did I, but I knew I was probably going to have to do something. So I'd also heard, hey, if you need to raise money fast, pick up that phone and start dialing for dollars and go out and network and, and uh, use your 30-second commercial, do your, your elevator pitch with people. So I, you know, I, I had this deal under contract. I had two weeks to remove subjects, and I just took massive action. I called up people left, right, and center, got rejected left, right, and center. I got my sensitive little feelings hurt, so I quit doing that. <laughs> then I went out and networked up a, a storm, went to the B&I, Chamber of Commerce, Toastmasters, wherever they'd let me in the door with my business cards, schmoozed up a storm, raised zero capital there. Ran out of time, got a one-week extension, thought, hey, you know what? This is such a good deal. If enough people see it, it's going to sell itself. So I put together a little one-pager PDF and spammed, I mean, emailed that out to a couple of hundred people on that, that I'd gathered. And all I succeeded in doing was ticking off a lot of really good potential investors and shooting myself in the foot. So I ended up losing that deal. And uh, I'm in a fairly small town, so I had, you know, some egg on my face. I ticked off my tenant buyer. I ticked off the seller, obviously, ticked off the realtor, the mortgage broker. Everybody was very, very ticked off, uh, myself included. And that's when I said, you know what? Um, maybe some people are successful raising capital that way, but that's not what I want to do. I don't think that's in my wheelhouse. And that's when I just kind of sat back and reflected and said, hey, I wonder if there's a way to apply what I understand and know about marketing to doing that with raising capital. And, and ideally, if I could wave the magic wand, instead of me chasing after investors, what if I could kind of turn it around a bit and get investors coming to me asking about my deals? So it took a while, but I came out with a process that's worked uh, well for me and it's worked really well for a lot of people as well. And I call that the money partner formula. Yeah. So it, please, if you may kind of uh, talk to us a bit about the money partner port formula, how did it come about? And um, is, is it a, is it a, um, a course or a process or a book that, that helps others to raise capital, but, but, or did it initially kind of help you and then you perfected a system and also use it to, to help others? Yeah, it, initially it helped me. So when I was, you know, back in, in 2010 to 2013, I was doing, uh, what we call tenant first rent to own deals. So we would find a really good tenant buyer. We go buy them a house, lease option it to them for two to three years while we help them get qualified for financing. So that's, that's what I was doing when I failed miserably at first. <laughs> and then I started coming up with this process, started applying it myself. And in that space, I raised uh, not a heck of a lot, but I'm going to say I raised five to 600,000 for those kind of little, single family home type deals at that time, probably more than that, but let's say about that. And then I ended up moving over into uh, multifamily investing, applied the same process, raised millions of dollars for multifamily properties following the process. And then I started, I did start, I started a course because I've got a background kind of in doing that kind of stuff, wrote a book about it, all that kind of thing. So started helping other people to do this. And then more recently, you guys, over the last five or six years, I'd say, I've really started focusing on providing done for you marketing services. And I've turned my business into more of a marketing agency for other mom and pop uh, real estate investors who want to get started with the process. Great, great. And when you speak about marketing, marketing is, is, a, is a broad kind of term. Is it marketing on the deal? Is it marketing on the sponsor, the, the syndicator or the active investor? Talk to us more about that marketing component. Yeah, it's marketing on the active investor side. I think most of the clients that we work with, uh, August, aren't quite at the stage where they're starting to do big syndication type deals. They tend to be, like I say, mom and pops that have run out of cash, run out of credits, like, okay, what, what next? Now, we have worked with people across all different kinds of, of uh, experience levels, 
but our sweet spot is really helping people get to the point where they can raise their first one to two million dollars for their deals. So that's Great. that's where we're, that's kind of our specific niche. Got it. And we, we, I, I kind of put a fine line between this concept of real estate, private equity, and also a joint venture. So uh, as soon as you're, you're, you go out there and you're raising, you know, um, private capital and you're advertising and you're marketing a deal and people who, who've never met you are investing with you, uh, it's, it's, it's no longer mom and pop. But if that you're dangerous, yeah, you know, that can be very dangerous if you do it wrong, as, as you guys course, are very, very fully aware. And I believe also on, on the U.S. side, it is exactly that line when the line gets crossed that if all your investors are, I'm not sure how it works on, in, in the Canadian uh, securities regulation, but in, on the U.S. side, as soon as that line is crossed where your investors are 100% passive and they're just coming on as, as money partners is where, uh, and it's not a joint venture and the structure is either LLC or a limited partnership, that's when you've made a switch to being in the private equity space. And that's when you have to follow the security guidelines that exist. I believe it's somewhat similar here in Canada as well. But go ahead if you were going to mention something. No, no, exactly. So again, that's why I see so many people making so many mistakes when they first get started with raising capital. You know, a lot of people figure, hey, you know what? I'll take anybody and everybody with a pulse and a checkbook right? <laughs> as my investors. And that's very, very dangerous for all of those reasons you just mentioned there, August. Like, first of all, first of all, there's common sense, right? So think about it. If we're trying to get somebody to invest fifty, a hundred thousand dollars or more with us, they need to know you, they need to like you, and they need to trust you with their money, right? And we're going out to strangers; they don't know you, they don't trust you, and they uh, they don't probably don't like you, and they definitely don't trust you with their money. <laughs> so you're starting from scratch. And that's a very difficult thing to do, especially without a track record. So logic's reason number one. Uh, legalities are reason number two. Now, time out here. I'm a marketing guy. I'm a real estate guy. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a security specialist. I'm not an accountant. So I'm just sharing my understanding of things here. So yeah, in the States, you got this little thing called the Securities and Exchange Commission. Each state has its own regulatory authority. Here in Canada, each province has its own regulatory authority. And basically, my understanding is they're saying it's illegal for you and I, as what I call mom and pop real estate investors, to raise capital from the general public, from strangers, unless, A, you're licensed to do so. So a stockbroker can raise capital from the general public. A financial planner can do that. I think in certain cases, a mortgage broker can do that. But these people tend to work for big financial entities, right? Or the other way we can get around that is if we get an offering memorandum or we set up a certain corporate structure in a certain way and get exemptions and all this kind of stuff, which for most mom and pops, you know, especially if you want to buy a, a duplex and, you know, the outskirts of the GTA or something like that, that's, that's kind of beyond what, what you need for that size of a deal, right? Or a single family home or you're doing a flip or whatever. So where does that leave us? How do we get started with this whole process? So, the, the logical place to start and the safest place to start, in my opinion, is with friends and family members, close business associates, because at least up here in Canada, that tends to be an exemption, right? We are allowed to work with people that we have a close personal relationship with. And quite frankly, I think that's the most logical place to start because that's where the low hanging financial fruit is. And quite frankly, who else is going to invest with you when you're first getting started? Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? And it's a good test. If your friends and family don't want to invest with you, that tells you you might be in the wrong business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, or you might be, because I because I tried it and it didn't work first time around. You might be going around about it the wrong way. That's yeah. the other challenge, right? Yeah. That's the yeah. importance of bringing, bringing on a coach or an advisor. But yeah, Absolutely. Yes. And you know what, Dave? I wanted to touch on that no like, and trust. As, as I've spent the last two years building CPI Capital, literally from the ground up. And I mean, August is kind of... Uh, I've helped out a bit, right? I hope. <laughs> I'm just joking. He said, <laughs> yeah. obviously, August has been there as well, right beside me, 24 hours a day. But I know personally how difficult it is to build that no like, and trust, right? right. So maybe you could please walk us through the initial steps an active real estate investor has to take to start cultivating and nurturing those relationships with investors? 
Yeah. So again, um, I call this my five-step money partner formula. I'm happy to walk you guys through a big picture. Please. Please. Uh, Please. Yeah. Step number one has two parts. Very, very important. Part number one is create a target group of prospective investors that you want to focus on. And again, who are these people? I'm going to suggest that they are folks in your sphere of influence, friends, family members, coworkers, business associates, people you know well from church, civic organizations, whatever you're involved in. Like, you know them, they know you. Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah. Now, what I always recommend for our clients is shoot for getting between 150 to 200 people in that initial target group. And people go, oh, geez, Dave, I don't know 200 people. What are you, crazy? And so I say, hey, here's what we do instead. Instead of trying to think up 200 people, if we started with 2,000 people and whittle it down, that's going to be a lot easier. So what we always do is we just say, hey, you know what? Step number one, export all of your contacts from your cell phone into an Excel spreadsheet. All right. Step number two, get all of your email contacts out of all your different email addresses. Don't sift for or filter yet. Just dump them in, do a data dump, get them all into that Excel spreadsheet. Same thing with your Facebook friends. Same thing with your LinkedIn contacts, your TikTok people, your Instagram follower, you know, whatever, whatever social media flavor you subscribe to, get all of those people out of there, get them into that spreadsheet. And then now, instead of having to think up 200 people, now just quickly go through that list. And when you see a name and a face pops into your mind and you, and you got a generally positive feeling about that person, keep them. Otherwise, you see a name, you got no clue what that person looks like or who they are, delete. Keep, 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 delete, 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 and whittle it down to a couple of hundred people. Does that make sense, you guys? Absolutely. Don't filter yet. I'm sure you guys are very, very well aware of this. You've been raising capital for a while. Quite often, because here's a big mistake people make. They say, well, no, I, should, I won't keep that person. They're broke. They assume, right? And there's a book that was written quite a while ago now called The Millionaire Next Door. And in that book, they talk about the fact that the vast majority of millionaires in North America don't look like millionaires should look according to Hollywood, right? They're, they're our neighbors. They drive regular vehicles. They live in regular houses. They just happen to be exceptionally good with their money. So never assume. Sometimes the people that are all flash don't have any cash and the people who are more modest do have quite a bit. So don't filter yet. Just focus on getting that core group of a couple of hundred people. And then as you guys are aware, especially when you're first starting, you don't necessarily need a hundred investors right off the get-go, right? Especially if your mom and pop just getting started. Chances are one or two, three investors are all you need to get that next deal up and running. Does that make sense, you guys? Yes. Yeah, so create that target group. Now, the second part of this step is very important. It's called learn from Dave's dumb mistakes. So you guys remember when I failed miserably at raising capital? Yes. I spammed everybody I knew with my with my deal. Well, the one smart thing I did was I came up with that list of a couple hundred people. The stupid thing I did was just, you know, rush in like a bull in a china shop and say, hey, it's Dave. I got a deal. Have you got any cash? Everybody just kind of gave me one of those, right? <laughs> okay. So here's, here's what you do instead. Here's what I suggest you do instead. Reconnect with people on a personal level first before you start talking business. Does that make sense, you guys? And there's a way that we can automate this or automate a lot of it. And that is if you send out, if you get set up with an email autoresponder system and you send out, create an email and send it out to all 200 people on your list, but it's personalized for each person. Okay. You follow me there? So personalized email, you don't have to send out 200 of them, just send out one, but send them, use one of these kind of programs. And the first email, the first message is just a nice warm fuzzy, hey, it's, uh, it's Dave, chances are it's been a while since we reconnected or connected. Here's what I've been up to, blah, 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 blah. Here's what the family's up to, the kids, the spouse, trips we've taken, impact of COVID, what's going on at work, what's going on in life, a nice just kind of catch up message. And at the end of it, you say something like, hey, well, that's what I've been up to. How about you? Please hit reply to this email. Let's catch up. Does that make sense, you guys? So you send a couple of messages like that. We send a third message out. That's what I call your transition message. And that gives that that sets the stage for the marketing that's going to be coming down the pipeline, right? So we don't want to hit them cold. We want to warm them up first. 
then transition them, let them know that, hey, we're going to start talking about real estate. Real estate is something we're really excited about. We're passionate about it. And uh, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, you might even want to invest with us at some point. Uh, so that kind of a message. Does that make sense, you guys? So that's that's step number one. Create a, a contact list, a target group, and reconnect with them on a personal level first. Nice. Great. Yeah. That's Great. fantastic. I wanted, I wanted to kind of go over also uh, the nurture aspect of it. So we, we, we talked about, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the deal, a lot of time there's, there's, a, you know, some, some sort of dogma around real estate investing that hey, as long as you find a deal that uh, the money will come. And as in, you know, as your case, and I'm sure there's a lot of investors out there that the timing, especially depending on how competitive the market is, there might not be even enough time to go and raise capital. Um, mm -hmm. So we discussed that portion of it. Then we discuss how to contact your uh, sphere of influence and not to kind of rush into that process. Mm -hmm. And now, Let's say, um, uh, you know, and, and this is uh, Ava and I speak to a lot of starting out real estate investors uh, and, and uh, we try to give them tips and points. It's not monetized in any way. Just uh, we spend a couple hours every week to, to chat with a, f a few starting out real estate investors. And the consistent issue that we hear about is that they're good at finding deals. They, 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 they do have certain uh, people that match their avatar, their kind of investor profile within their network. But... Mm -hmm. They, and they have connected with them. They've sent them a few emails. They've told them what, what they do, but they haven't nurtured that relationship. They, have, they haven't been consistent with it. So after a few months, they call the person back up, say, hey, I got a deal, and, or send them an email, and the person doesn't remember who they are. Right. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter where that connection comes from, if it's your, uh, mm -hmm. uh, your, your um, kind of circle of influence, if it's your inner network, or somebody you've connected with in a meetup group or, uh, you know, or on, 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 on social media. There needs to be a level of nurture that they consistently will get in some sort of information from you if it's a newsletter. So talk to us about that nurture aspect of it and what advice you could give to um, to investors. Oh, for sure, Artis. That's an awesome point. And that is, I agree with you 100%. That's the number one thing people screw up, right? They get a deal. You see this massive flurry of activity where they're marketing up the storm. Then they either get they do the deal or the fall, deal falls through, and then it's crickets for six months till the next deal, right? And then you know just going going crazy. I completely agree with you. You you need to have that what I call constant, consistent, edutaining communication. Now here's what I've found, you guys, and and your case might be a little bit different because of the, the group you're going after, but. For most mom and pops, when it comes to starting to, to raise capital, their prospective investors are everyday people, right? They're not necessarily super sophisticated, accredited investor types. They're definitely not real estate entrepreneurs. They're not real estate investors. They're Joe Public, right? They're, they're, they're people they already know, but they're not necessarily into real estate investing. And here's an interesting statistic I've heard thrown around a few times. And that is that 95% of the general population has never purchased an investment property. Their own house does not count, okay? Your own private residence doesn't count. An investment property. Does that sound about right to you guys? Like the general population? For sure. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So here's the thing. We got to keep in mind that 95% of the people on your prospective investor list are not real estate investors. They're regular people. So if we get too crazy with the jargon, with data, with overwhelming people with too much information, they're going to zone out and not pay any attention. So my recommendation is always this. Keep it high level. Keep it what I call Reader's Digest level. I don't know if you guys remember Reader's Digest, hmm. but that's a magazine that's written for grownups. However, it's written at a 13-year-old reading level. That means any average kid in grade eight can pick up Reader's Digest and understand everything in that magazine. I'm going to recommend to your viewers that they do the same thing with their marketing. Keep it Reader's Digest level. Assume that the other person is not really interested in the nitpicky details of real estate investing. Here's what they are interested in. They want to get the gist of it and they want to know that you know your stuff. Does that make sense, you guys? Yes. Absolutely. So that's what we call edutaining marketing. A little bit educational, a little bit, hopefully a little bit entertaining and then consistent. So for example, when we're working with private clients, 
what we'll do, we'll get them set up. We'll get them set up with a, an investor specific website that becomes your online marketing hub. And then we have something coming out at least once a week from them to their list. So they're always, you know, we try to get them top of mind and then stay top of mind with their target group of prospective investors. So one week, the first week of the month, it might be their electronic newsletter, their monthly newsletter, right? That comes up. The second week, maybe it's a blog post. The third week, maybe it's a video log. Fourth week, maybe another blog post. Then another month, the next easing, ding, 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 ding. So again, edutaining, we do our best to make it edutaining, a little bit educational, a little bit entertaining. And always have, here's the other thing, always have a call to action at the end of your marketing, right? Hey, if you'd like to find out more, click on the link, book a call. Let's see how this can work for you. That's that great advice. Sense? Great advice. I always say a confused mind doesn't make a decision. So or says no. Or it's says no. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Or, or runs away because they're like, this is too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, when we do our stuff, I definitely always keep that top of mind. Yeah. Um, that's great advice. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then again, some of the most effective presentations I've seen are again, at that Reader's Digest level. Because even if the other person is a relatively experienced investor, they appreciate the fact that we're not making them think too hard. Does no. that make sense, you guys? Yeah, sure. definitely. You brought me back to some childhood memories because my dad used to always read Reader's Digest. Ah, yeah. Well, how old I am. <laughs> Thanks, Ava. Thanks for rubbing a little salt in the wound there. I know I'm old. No, 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 you're hilarious. Great. Um, yeah, yeah, and this, we, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was yeah, going to go kind ahead. of t talk about the next topic, if, if that's okay. Uh, you're going to steal uh, from me? You go uh, ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> if you like, go ahead. And, uh, no, we, we wanted to make the connection about kind of that, yeah. that nurture process, but also um, now if, if, if you're letting the nurture process go somewhat uh, hyperbolic uh, and to kind of put it on steroids, it, it creates this, um, uh, this concept of thought leadership platform. Mm -hmm. um, so, so now you're consistently sending out content, not only you're sending out content, it also a plat is a platform to, to be able to cultivate a relationship with potential investors and, and clients. So, um, so rather than just sending out uh, monthly newsletters and other items that you mentioned, like blogs and videos, but if you have a thought leadership platform, like a YouTube channel, like as we do, or a podcast, um, that in itself can supplement your investor nurturing, but also can it then generate it, its own group of investors who mm -hmm. kind of, um, uh, you know, get interested in your material. So just want to kind of discuss that aspect as well. And, and also oh, just, sure. just one moment is, 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 is that a recommendation made to your clients that, Hey, depending on their situation, depending on their level, you talk about mom and uh, mom and pops, I, I'm sure that your first recommendation is not go and start a pop podcast and a YouTube no, show. So, so talk to us about, about that aspect of it. Yeah, well, there's all sorts of things that, that people can do. But again, uh, August, what I found is with a lot of our clients, again, they're, they're part-time real estate investors. Eventually, they'd like to become full-time real estate investors. Quite often, they're working at a job already. They're not necessarily entrepreneurs yet. So they don't really quite understand the whole sales and marketing side of things just yet. So if <laughs> if I ram, ram, hey, you know, write a book or, you know, which, which is one of the things that we do with our, our clients is we'll actually co-author books with them. But that's not where you're going to start, right? Uh, or start a podcast or start a YouTube channel or, you know, start your own TV show or all these kind of things. That's, that's so far beyond the context of most people when they're first starting that let's take baby steps first. But definitely, you know, once you've squeezed the juice out of friends and family, once you've got that, you know, that one to two million dollars that, that most of us can raise from our circle of our sphere of influence, then yeah, you're probably gonna have to look at doing the next step. And that can take that can take the form of many things. One really good idea, you guys, you know, having your own YouTube channel, that's awesome. Your own podcast, combination of both, that's awesome. But the other thing you can do is be a guest on other people's podcasts and YouTube channels, like, kind of like what I'm doing here, right? So that if when anytime that you are being interviewed, that's going to position you as an automatic authority, especially if what comes out of your mouth is relatively intelligent. <laughs> Great advice. Great yeah. advice. 
Um, should we go to the next question here, yeah. August? Okay, think, you know yeah. what? Yeah, Dave, I'd like to discuss uh, this Canada-US dynamic in the real estate private equity space. So August and I, in our research, we have noticed that you've been featured on a lot of US-based platforms, um, yeah. and many US operators and other experts have spoken about your platform. Um, so maybe you could talk to us about the similarities and especially the differences that exist in the real estate investing space when talking about US and Canada. Well, that's the nice thing about what I do, you guys, is this process that we do for our clients, uh, from what I can tell, works nicely in any area of the free world where we are allowed to buy property. And one way or the other, we are allowed to bring private investors on board along for the ride with us, right? Because what we do is we focus on the marketing side of things. I do not claim to be an expert on the you know, how to structure your deals with your investors, how to be set up so that you're compliant with the Securities and Exchange Commission or anything like that, because it's so much, it's so different for everybody. And it's not so much just based on where they're located, although there are, from what I understand, differences state to state in some cases, but it really depends on how are you bringing that money partner on board? Are they going to, like August was saying, are they going to be a joint venture partner are they bringing in capital and helping to get qualified for financing? Are they going to be involved in some aspect of the, the business? Or are they you know, just going to be basically a, a, a silent investor that's putting in their money? And how are they going to be secured? How is, how is the structure going to be done? So that's, that's beyond my pay grade. Um, I'm, I'm not there. So we always make sure that our clients get the appropriate legal counsel about that we don't claim to be experts in that thing in that area but your system can work for canadian um investors or u.s investors trying to utilize the process you've created to exactly raise money. again it's all about the logic right let's start when you're starting with raising capital let's start with the low-hanging fruit and that's people that already know you right so how how you have to structure that to stay compliant is going to be different place to place but the process of of shaking that tree and 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 getting that fruit is the same. Great, great. And and w one more topic before we get into the next segment of our show is um, when it, it, what is the kind of format of your your services? Because it it seems like it is a service that I personally notice that many starting investors or even active investors who want to scale their business would need. And I think you've you've put something truly incredible together. But but what does it look like? Is it a, is it a course? Is it, is it your book? Is it an actual one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching? What, what does it look like? What is that main service that you offer to uh, investors? It's yes to all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so we got all sorts of different stuff, uh, you guys. We've got, what, where are we? We've got the book, which uh, if, if any of your viewers are interested in that, they can grab a free copy in exchange for their name and their e email address here, okay. investorattractionbook.com. Awesome. You notice I spared no time or expense putting together that sign for you guys. Uh, so, so that that gets in the book. That kind of gets them into our sphere. But then what we do, like I said, is I've got a boutique marketing agency. So the way we typically bring on new clients is we have them attend a full day workshop where we spend eight hours together on Zoom, small group format, usually 40 or 50 people per workshop. And we take a deep dive into the whole process. And if somebody's a real diehard, do-it-themselves kind of person, they're going to understand everything that they need and everything they need to do to go out and start raising capital. And then what we do is we offer them the big red easy button. And that is for us to set all of this stuff up for them. Their, their database, their um, website, their slide deck presentation, their investor presentation, their marketing, e-zines, video logs, blog posts, uh, webinars, the whole bit so that we can get them launched in the first three to four months and get their first one, two, three, four, five investors under their belt. 
That's really cool. You mean there was a big red easy button that I could have pressed this whole time and you made me do this from the ground up? <laughs> That's incredible because I know myself what it takes and it sure takes a lot. This marketing is not an easy thing. And then putting everything together, I, I definitely can understand the pain points that exist and how much people truly love your your red easy button there. Yeah, well, can I, we did discuss this earlier, guys, but if you're open to it, I, I would be very happy to offer your your viewers an opportunity to attend one of our workshops and thanks to you guys, get in for half price. Is that something that, that might be interesting to people? Amazing. Amazing. That's incredible. Is that okay? Well, yeah. this, we're doing this on the fly because we didn't even talk about this ahead of time. So <laughs> okay. forgive me. But, that would be really, um, be really great. Let's, let's do this. Can we make the discount code CPI? Would that be all right? Yeah, all right. absolutely. Let's do this then, you guys. So I got a little fancier with this one. Yes. So here you go. InvestorAttractionWorkshop.com. And if you put in the code CPI, make sure it's all caps. Make sure that, there we go. CPI, all caps. That will get you a ticket for half price, courtesy of Ava and August. Amazing. Thank you, good? Thank, Thank you, you. That's great. That's and we'll so we'll great. definitely make, make sure to market that as of much as course. we can to get more people to join because I, I really see the need that exists. And especially since what we've been through for the last couple of years, just yeah. like you said, if we knew such services existed, we would have signed up a long time ago. So yeah, you'll help a lot of people. Awesome. Thanks for that, Dave. Um, okay. I'm excited to hear Dave's uh, answers to uh, the 10 championship rounds to financial oh, freedom. <laughs> now you got me nervous. <laughs> Whatever comes top to your top of your mind. Well, that could be dangerous too. <laughs> That's all right. Let's go for it. Okay, here we go. Question number one: Who is the most influential person in your life? My mother. Okay. Yeah. What is the number one book you'd recommend? Ooh, you guys! How can you narrow things down to one book, right? <laughs> you know, and I'm and I was I kind of suspected you're going to be coming up with that question. Um, I've got so many number one books. One that I've often recommended is called The Ultimate Sales Machine. Have you guys heard of that? Chet Holmes, The Ultimate Sales Machine. It's a sales and marketing book because I'm a sales and marketing kind of guy. Love that book. Is it directly related to real estate? No, but it's, but it's awesome. Um, but recently, this book has become one of my new favorites. Who Not How, Dan Sullivan. Yes. Um, I'm just finally getting my button gear and joining strategic coach this year. But that book just makes so much sense. I've been doing it a little bit for the last number of years, but this has really kicked me into gear. And instead of always trying to figure out how the hell do I do something, figure out who already knows how to do it, who already likes doing it and hire them to do it for you. <laughs> right. Delegate, 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 delegate. Delegate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you had the opportunity to travel back in time, what advice would you give your younger self? Hmm. Well, it's overused, but I would say enjoy the journey more, you know, instead of being so focused. Goals are important. They, they really are. But when you are so laser focused on the goal that you don't enjoy what the hell is going on in your life at the moment, it's, that's a real pity. And I found myself over the years slipping into that on more than one occasion. So enjoy the journey. You know, stop, smell the roses, appreciate your kids while they're small. All those kind of things are, are very important. That's great. That's great. What is the best investment you've ever made? Best investment I've ever made. <clears throat> well, you know what? It, it, <laughs> it's, it's a number of years ago now. And I was, I, I was one of those diehard do-it-yourself kind of people. Um, frugal would be a word for it. Cheap as hell might be another word for it. And I remember I was working on a presentation, like a slideshow presentation. And it just, and I'd already had quite a bit of experience doing them. I just kept fell on, falling flat on my face. It wasn't working. And at the time, I was part of a high-level mastermind, and a couple of guys there helped people with their presentations. But they charged 10 grand US and you had to travel down to Orlando, Florida to, to spend a day with them. And I was hesitant to do that until I finally said, okay, enough's enough. And I went and I did it. 
And they helped me out for a day, polished up my presentation. Three days after I got back, I did that presentation and I believe did about $60,000 in business the very first time I used that presentation. So that was probably the best direct investment uh, I can remember. And then I use that same presentation over and over and over again after that. So there's an That's example. Incredible. Awesome. Yeah. Now, what's the worst investment you've ever made? Oh, should we talk about network marketing opportunities of years gone by? Should we talk about <laughs> crypto stuff of years gone by? Should we talk about <laughs> uh, should we talk about buying the wrong property in the wrong location for the wrong people a couple of times there have been a number of, of <laughs> stupid well learning experiences let's put it that way yeah a little a little grayer a little wiser <laughs> there you go yeah now how much okay here's the next question how much would you need in the bank to retire today what's your number I don't believe in having any money in the bank necessarily. I believe in passive income. So it's not how much money in the bank, it's how much money's coming in from whatever the different sources are. And quite frankly, you guys, um, I'm one of those very fortunate individuals. I absolutely love what I do. And I don't plan on retiring because most people I see that retire, get old and die really quick. So, um, my goal is to never retire. My goal is to always keep what little bit of uh, cerebral cortex I've got active and, and doing stuff and keeping engaged. That's what I want to do. Amazing. Yeah. If you could have dinner with someone dead or alive, who would it be? Hmm. Somebody dead or alive. <laughs> You know what? I would I, I would think I would find it very interesting to have dinner with any one of the space billionaires right now. So either Musk or Bezos or Sir Richard Branson, any one of those three guys I would really enjoy having dinner with. Awesome. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing now? Probably digging ditches and not being very happy about it. <laughs> well, I, I really, you know what? I don't know what I'd be doing. That's a good question. I've tried a few different things. I, I did the language training business. That was fun for, for a while. Glad I'm not doing that. Uh, initially looked at getting in, involved as a financial planner. Really happy I didn't do that. So I, I don't know what the heck I'd be doing. Awesome. You mean Costa Rica? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I love this one. Book smarts or street smarts? Street smarts by far. Okay. Yeah. If, last question. If you had a million dollars cash and you had to make one investment today, what would it be? I would probably split that up between 10 different multifamily investors and invest in 10 different multifamily deals. Nice. Nice. That's we like to hear that. My, my topic. <laughs> Great, awesome. awesome. Was, Thanks. Thanks, Dave. That's a wrap. <laughs> yeah, no, thank, thank you, you guys much. very much. Awesome. Now, Dave, you could just quickly let people know what is the best way that they can reach you? Yeah, one of those two ways. So again, the way to get into my sphere is InvestorAttractionBook.com. If you want to spend a full day, get to know all this stuff, InvestorAttractionWorkshop.com. Use CPI, all caps, to get that 50% discount. And that will get you a full day of yours truly taking a deep dive into this whole process. Awesome. Thank you, Dave, for taking the time. There was a lot of uh, golden nuggets that we got to take away from this show, and I'm sure our viewers also will enjoy it and have lots of um, lots to take away from. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Dave. My pleasure. Hey, you guys, I'd love to have you on my show as well, so hopefully you're open to that. We would Absolutely. love that. Thanks so much, yeah, Dave, for being great. such a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you.